During the coronavirus pandemic, we've become strangely used to the idea of not being allowed to get too close to one another, just as though we're in the middle of some metaphorical zorb balls. This practice of social distancing is literally vitally important in our fight against the virus. But realistically, we're not always free to spread out as much as we like. In some places, like schools or cultural venues, space is limited. And there's a pressure to fit in as many people as possible while still following social distancing protocols. If you're a mathematician at heart, you might be inclined to abstract away all the people from this scenario and rephrase the problem as one of packing circles. In fact, this is only one of three ideas, partly thought-provoking, partly hilarious, about how to apply math to the coronavirus pandemic presented in a recent article by Katie Stackles, which I'll link to in the description. The pressing question is now, what is the densest way to pack circles? Is it this one? Or maybe this one? Or maybe something completely different? Before we can answer this question, we first need to make its formulation a bit more precise. First of all, what do we actually mean by circle packing? For us, this will be an arrangement of unit circles in the infinite plane, which may touch but not overlap. So something like this is allowed, whereas something like this is not. I've highlighted the words unit and infinite here because they are what makes this problem manageable. Now, you might rightfully object that in the social distancing scenario that I've described before, we don't actually have an infinite amount of space. But for the moment, just run with me on this one and I'll come back to it later. Next up, we need to clarify how we're actually going to measure density. So let's look at some generic circle packing like this one. I would argue that it's actually pretty clear how to define density. As long as we give ourselves a finite boundary region to work with, like this one. We can now look at the area of the packing inside the region, which is highlighted yellow here, and divide that by the total area of the region, like this. Since we're actually dealing with packings of the infinite plane, we will define the density as the limit of this quotient, as the red region grows to infinity. Now, there are clearly some technicalities that I'm sweeping under the rug here. It's not clear whether this limit will always exist or whether its existence or value would depend on the shape of the red boundary region. But going into technical detail about these kinds of questions is unfortunately just outside the scope of this video. If our packing is periodic in the sense that it repeats itself, then there's actually a really nice shortcut to help us compute this number. As a first concrete example, let's look at what's called the square packing. It looks like this. Now, we can draw in some finite boundary region like this one. We can observe that the infinite plane is tiled by infinitely many copies of this square. This allows us to conclude that the density of the infinite packing is in fact just the density inside the red region, which turns out to be the area of one full circle divided by the area of a square of side length 2. Since we're dealing with unit circles, this pans out to be pi over 4 or 78.5%. There is another rather obvious packing called the hexagonal packing, which looks like this. We can connect the centers of the circles to form a regular hexagon. In fact, we can subdivide the hexagon even further into equilateral triangles. The periodicity allows us to conclude that the density of the infinite packing is just the density inside that one triangle. This turns out to be the area of a half circle divided by the area of an equilateral triangle of side length 2. Concretely, this pans out to be pi over the square root of 12, or approximately 90.7%. So clearly, the hexagonal packing is more dense than the square packing. But is it really the densest packing possible? Now, let's look at a more generic circle packing like this one. One idea you might come up with is to start by asking a sort of local version of the question. We can do this by drawing in a little triangle which connects the centers of three adjacent circles. Let's zoom in on this triangle. And let's call its vertices A, B and C. We can observe that the yellow area is exactly the area of a half circle. This is because the yellow area is composed of three circle sectors 
whose angles add up to 180 degrees as they do in every triangle. Since we're dealing with unit circles, this area of a half circle turns out to be pi over 2. Now let's zoom out again. Is this property true for every triangle we could draw? Apparently not. In this case, we've missed this green little sliver here, so the yellow area will be strictly less than the area of a half circle. Now, for which triangles does the equation at the bottom hold? If you think about it, the equation will continue to hold as long as the situation looks something like this. Here, the line connecting the centers of the bottom two circles is exactly tangent to the upper circle. For which angles alpha does this hold? Let's draw in the height h of this triangle. Since the line at the bottom is not supposed to intersect the upper circle, h has to be greater than 1. We can express h using the cosine of alpha halves and the length of the hypotenuse, which is 2, because it's exactly twice the radius of the circles. If we solve this for alpha, we get that alpha has to be less than 2 pi thirds, or 120 degrees. Let's just call the triangle with this property nice. Now what can we say about the density of a packing inside a nice triangle like the one on the left? Nice means that the largest angle alpha is less than 2 pi thirds, and the largest angle of any triangle is always at least pi thirds. As seen before, we can conclude that the yellow area is exactly the area of a half circle or pi over 2. If we look up some sine tables, we'll see that the sine of alpha is at least the square root of 3 over 2. This allows us to estimate the area of the triangle. By a classic formula, this area is given as the product b times c of the two sides adjacent to alpha times the sine of alpha all divided by 2. Since b and c have a length of at least 2, this area turns out to be at least the square root of 3. Combining these two facts, we obtain that the density of the packing inside the nice triangle is at most pi over the square root of 12, which is, as you may recall, exactly the density of the hexagonal packing. Now, whenever you have an inequality like this, it's worth considering the equality case. As always, this equality case occurs exactly if all the inequalities we've seen before are in fact equalities. So the sine of alpha has to be exactly equal to the square root of 3 over 2, which, given the constraints on alpha, means that alpha has to be pi thirds, or 60 degrees, and the side lengths b and c have to be exactly 2. In summary, equality occurs if and only if the triangle ABC is equilateral with side length 2. If you recall, equilateral triangles with side length 2 are exactly the fundamental building blocks of the hexagonal packing. At this point, we have successfully solved the local version of our question. We have shown that if we're only considering three circles, then the optimal arrangement is the one where the centers form an equilateral triangle of side length 2. Moving forward, we have to discuss how to aggregate our locally optimal solutions into a globally optimal solution. Let's look at a generic packing and region like these. Clearly, we can subdivide the interior into triangles. It is not true that the density inside the whole region would simply be the sum of the densities inside the triangles. That's just not how densities work. Instead, they obey the following slightly more complicated formula. Take a moment to sanity check that one. The sum sign in this expression is supposed to range over all the triangles which make up the region. Now, as complicated as this formula might seem, it still holds true that the density in the entire region is bounded by pi over the square root of 12, since the density inside each one of the triangles is bounded that way. Also, we have equality for the density of the entire region, if and only if we have equality for the density inside each of the triangles. So in fact, we have shown that the hexagonal packing is optimal once we've shown that we can always decompose regions into these nice triangles. Now, you might object that we've just replaced one hard problem with another hard problem. But the advantage is that triangulations like these have been investigated before because they are desirable for other reasons. 
The concept I would like to introduce now are so-called Delaunay triangulations. Their goal is to maximize the minimum angle in a triangulation. Notice that before we were actually looking for triangulations which minimize the maximum angle, but since the angles in a triangle always add up to 180 degrees, these two problems are clearly related, and I will get back to this issue later. Just to be clear on what we mean here. We look at a packing like this, abstract away all the circles and just look at the center points. Then we consider their convex hull, which is just the region bounded by the outermost of those points. We are looking for a subdivision of this region into triangles. In this decomposition, the triangles almost look like regular equilateral triangles. And what we're trying to avoid are triangulations like this one. Here, there are a lot of very obtuse angles, and this is something not only we want to avoid, but also people in computer graphic, because these angles tend to cause rounding errors. To quantify these angles, we can consider so-called circumcircles. Let's look at a generic triangle. Its circumcircle is the unique circle which passes through all of its vertices. Let's look at another example. Here, the center of the circumcircle actually lies outside of the triangle itself, and the area of the circumcircle is much greater compared to the area of the triangle than in the previous case. So as a rule of thumb, we can say that large minimum angles in a triangle correspond to small circumcircles relative to the area of that triangle. This motivates the definition of Delaunay triangulations, which have to satisfy the Delaunay condition that no circumcircle contains a point of another triangle. Take a moment to make sure that it's clear what this condition is supposed to say. Okay, so if we were lazy, we could call out the proof done here, because the existence of Delaunay triangulations has been discussed elsewhere. But personally, I wouldn't find this line of reasoning motivating. So the next and final step in the proof will be to explain a very nice way to generate such triangulations. The method that I want to explain is based on so-called Voronoi diagrams, which are a whole interesting topic in their own right. They're actually fairly simple to understand. You start with a set of points, and then you let circles grow radially outward from each of those points, like so. It's probably clear how this could model some basic form of cell growth. Let's draw in these regions for the generic circle packing that we looked at before. Let's look at one of the edges of such a region, like the one highlighted in red in the middle. By construction, it consists of those points which are the same distance away from the two red points in the center. We can take this a step further and look at the points where two edges intersect the vertices of these regions. Again, by construction, such a vertex will have the same distance to the three neighboring center points. If we form a triangle from these two, three centers, then the circumcircle of this triangle will not contain any of the other points we started with. Let's repeat this process for the other vertices. This way we have generated a very nice triangulation. In a certain sense, Voronoi diagrams and Delaunay triangulations are dual objects of one another. For those who know the jargon, they are in fact really the dual graphs of one another. To finish our proof, we only have to show that Delaunay triangles are in fact nice. This is just the resolution of the issue I've mentioned before about the difference between maximizing a minimum angle and minimizing the maximum angle. Let's do a proof by contradiction and look at the following triangle. If its largest angle alpha is at least 2 pi thirds, then the smallest angle beta is at most pi over 6. We can use the sine law, a standard trig identity, to find the radius r of the circumcircle of that triangle. The sine law says that 2 times r is equal to b divided by the sine of beta, where b is the sine opposite of the angle beta. Since b has a length of at least 2, and beta is at most pi over 6, 2 times r turns out to be at least 4, so r is at least 2. But given such a large circumcircle, we could in fact add a circle to the packing, namely the circle 
whose center is given by the circumcenter of the previous triangle. The low bound for R ensures that this new circle doesn't overlap with any of the old circles, and the Delaunay condition ensures that there are no other conflicting circles as well. And with this, we're done. We've proven that the hexagonal packing is the unique densest circle packing in the infinite plane. Since this has probably been a lot to wrap your head around, let's recap. Our question was about the globally densest packing. We first asked the local question instead and drew in a bunch of triangles. We showed that if we're only considering three circles, then the optimal arrangement is the one where the centers form an equilateral triangle of side length 2. We discussed how the local notion of density relates to the global notion of density and concluded that the hexagonal packing is optimal once we've shown that we can always find nice triangulations. This led us naturally to consider the notion of Delaunay triangulations. And in order to show that these always exist, we resorted to the idea of Voronoi diagrams. This proof was first published in an article by Chang and Wang from 2010, which I'll link to in the description. It only has four pages and doesn't seem to be very well known, so do check it out. I'd like to finish this video by giving a bit of context. There are a number of ways to generalize or modify the question we've looked at. For example, you could consider higher dimensions. The problem of packing spheres in three dimensions is the much more famous Kepler conjecture. There are a lot of good videos about this and I'll provide links in the description. Even though it took a long while, this conjecture is now a theorem and it turns out that in three dimensions there are infinitely many optimal ways to pack spheres, some of which look like the ones on the right. In fact, this problem of hypersphere packing, as it's called, has only been solved in dimensions 1, 2, 3, 8 and 24. As another variation, you could look at circle packings inside bounded regions, so for example circle packings inside circles or circle packings inside squares. To be honest, the latter type of problem is actually closer to the social distancing scenario described in the beginning. So admittedly, the video title was a bit clickbaity here. But the statement that we've shown about locally optimal packings still holds true, and most of these problems inside bounded regions can in fact only be solved by algorithms and not by mathematical theorems. As another variation, you could look at general metric spaces. Implicitly, everything we've done here is only about circles with respect to the standard Euclidean metric. But there's nothing preventing you from asking the same question for different metrics, where the circles may look like the ones on the right. As yet another variation, you could experiment with different size ratios. This means that the circles could be of different sizes, and this again changes the structure of optimal solutions greatly. Finally, I was honestly surprised by how many applications all of these topics have. Circle packings play into complex analysis, medicine and even origami. There's a really nice Veritasium video explaining this connection, which I'll link to in the description. That's it for this video, I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching.